Good afternoon, class of 2016. My name is Sabrina Baum, and on behalf of my fellow class marshals, Yasin Eldick, Sandra Huff, Diana Liebenau, Amy Wolfson, and Victor Zapana, I am honored to welcome you to class day. Tomorrow represents a milestone for all of us, a day that we've all worked hard for and deserve to celebrate. So today we gather to recognize and thank the friends, family, and classmates who have helped us reach this point. We thank the professors who have challenged us and helped us find our way in and out of the classroom. We thank the staff who run our school so smoothly. From welcome... <laughs> From welcoming us at the dining halls during that five-minute coffee break that gets us through class, to running the clinics that have been a formative part of many of our experiences here. That is one of the greatest parts of Harvard Law School. We've been fortunate to attend an institution that has offered us a wealth of different experiences. It has been amazing to watch the different things that our classmates have done in just three short years here. Some have stood up in court as prosecutors and defense counsel, helped clients obtain asylum, worked for US senators, helped draft contracts for NFL teams, and been cited in judicial opinions. And those are just a few examples. Each of us has chosen our path, and I can't wait to see the amazing work that our classmates do starting tomorrow after we walk across that stage. But before we graduate from HLS, let's take this day to thank everyone who has helped us get here. We have a wonderful program ahead of us and are excited to kick off the festivities. So with that, we congratulate you and turn over the floor to Dean Martha Minow. Thank you, Sabrina. And what an honor it is to be here today to celebrate the Harvard Law School class of 2016. All that you have done individually and collectively indeed cause for celebration. Tomorrow, we will join the whole university and then award degrees. Today, we honor all who have contributed to the law school and to the broader community. Today's honorees stand out for their passion and commitment, both to Harvard Law School and to the larger world. It is my great pleasure to share the stage with your superb class marshals. Our fabulous staff and, uh, and teaching award winners, Gabriella Follett and Jeannie Suk. Our very special class day speaker, Ms. Sarah Jessica Parker. Known for her talent, her vision, her public service, and yes, her fashion forward sensibility. Our Dean of Students, Marcia Sells. Woo! Our Chair of the Alumni Association, Salvo Arena. I turn the program over now to Dean Sells, who will introduce our honorees to you. And I thank you all, family, friends, for making this occasion so wonderful and possible. Enjoy. Hello. product of age, sorry. Um, I'm so excited to be here at Harvard Law School. This is literally my first uh, commencement and class day ceremony. Um, I've had the pleasure of meeting most of the graduates of 2016, 
And at one point or another during this year, my first year has been one of wonder, challenge, but it's all been amazing. I know I will remember it. And it now gives me great pleasure to start to introduce the honorees. Our first is the Andrew Kaufman Pro Bono Service Award. This award is granted each year in honor of the professor Andrew Kaufman, who has been instrumental in creating and supporting the pro bono service program at Harvard Law School. The award is given to the JD student in the graduating class who exemplifies the pro bono public spirit and extraordinary commitment to improving and delivering high quality volunteer legal service to disadvantaged communities. Selection is based on the service to law-related public service projects or organizations, the quality of the work performed, and the impact on the community. I am extremely delighted to announce that the 2016 Kaufman Award winner is Joseph J. Mikolakis. Joseph, please stand up. I have a few more, you have to stay. I have more things to say about Joseph. You have devoted more than 2,000 hours of your time to pro bono work during your time at Harvard Law School. Your nominators highlighted you as a standout, as, partic as a particularly accomplished student doing critically important advocacy in housing and immigration legal bureau, at the immigration and at the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau where you also represented numerous clients in various areas of practice, including wage and hour and housing cases. You engaged in every aspect of litigation. You've drafted court documents, conducted negotiations, written settlement agreements, argued motions, and represented clients at trial. You were a lead counsel on a hotly contested bench trial, which you won. We are so proud to see you receive this award and are incredibly thankful for your tireless work and service. The next award was started five years ago when the law school lost a beloved colleague, mentor, and friend, William Stunts, a renowned scholar of criminal justice who died after a long battle with cancer. Bill's influential scholarship over the past three decades addressed the full spectrum of issues related to criminal justice and procedure, from the overcrowding of prisons of ra to racial disparities, disparities in incarceration. In his decades on the Harvard Law School faculty, Bill touched the lives of so many of our students. He was also a Sac Foyne Teaching Award winner in 2004. In his honor, the law school established the William J. Stunts Award to recognize the graduating student who, in his or her time at Harvard Law School, has demonstrated an exemplary commitment to justice, respect for human dignity, and compassion. I am delighted that the members of also of Bill's family are here today, as they have been in past years, and I'd like to recognize them, that is, and welcome Ms. Ruth Stunts and her husband, Honorable Herman J. Smith. Please stand, Ms. Stunts. Thank you. And I'm delighted to recognize the winner of the 2016 William J. Stunts Award, Katie King. Katie, your work in the International Human Rights Clinic over the past two years epitomizes a commitment to justice, respect for human dignity, and compassion. Your nominators commented on how you had been a true leader and innovator on the right to education litigation in South Africa. You have been dedicated to advancing issues in this case and consistently been able to engage with South African attorneys who have dedicated their careers to the right to education in their country. 
You also have worked with the Law and International Development Society, the Program on International Law and Armed Conflict, and distinguished yourself on the Global Anti-Corruption Blog. For these reasons, we are delighted to honor you with the 2016 Stunts Award. The David Westfall Memorial Award, our next honor, is in, in honor of the late Professor David Westfall, who taught at the law school for more than 50 years until his death in 2006. David was beloved by students. At a time when many faculty are contemplating retirement, he enthusiastically volunteered to lead one of the new sections when we expanded them in 2002 and he enjoyed terrific popularity in this role. It is fitting that we honor his memory by recognizing a student who has made significant contributions to their class over the last three years. This year's David Westfall Memorial Award goes to Yassine El Deek. Yassine? Your HLS classmates as a whole seem very indebted to you. Your nominators quite clearly see you as their community leader. One commented, I can think of no student who better embodies HLS community spirit than Yassine. Over his three years at Harvard, Yassine has worked to not only better the school, but to bring students together. He has dedicated his time to a number of student organizations and community projects, including serving as class marshal, member of the Lambda Board, and several other student organizations, as well as serving as research assistant for multiple professors, all while succeeding academically. He also played a critical role in the Muslim Law Students Association's distribution of a video that targeted youth in, this year, inspired by It Gets Better campaign which shows a commitment not only to the HLS community, but beyond. Yassine continued to bring students together during his second and third year of law school. It's almost impossible to spend a day at HLS and not receive a warm greeting from Yassine, or be, infect be affected by his infectious positive energy. I'm not sure if Yassine simply has a perfect memory, or he just happens to know everything about everyone, it is rare time when you walk down the halls with Yassine without him saying hello to 50 different students asking about their parents, their kids, pets, recent moves. Another nominator said, Yassine Eldik loves Harvard Law School. <coughs> he loves the institution with all his heart. <coughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, Yassine. I got choked up. <laughs> he is grateful, we are grateful at this time to affirm in all of his gratitude every day through his consistent passion for the school and everyone with it. We truly are blessed to have had him. Thank you, Yassine. I should have known this would happen. The Frank Rickheimer Prize is awarded annually to the graduating student in recognition of exceptional citizenship within the law school community. Faculty, staff, and students submitted nominations for the Rickheimer Prize. And I'm You were passing this on. <laughs> I apologize. I am pleased to announce that this year's recipient is Isabel Gillian Brewer. <laughs> Isabel, you have served the past two years for the board with the Board of Student Advisors, 
including the past year as president. You have strived to heighten inclusivity, both within the BSA and on campus, even initiating the first ever workshop for BSA students on subconscious bias. Your nominators noted that you have dedicated yourself to social justice, both inside and outside the classroom. You exemplify inclusivity, not just in your policies and practice, but in your spirit and character. You have worked tirelessly to make the HLS campus an even better place than one you found it when you arrived. Through your work, you have pushed every organization you are a part of to be more sensitive to diversity and more open to the broader HLS community. On top of your management talents, you are also incredibly kind. You dedicate, you dedicate your life to listening to those around you, exemplifying true compassion, and then learning from those around you to channel your energies in the most impactful and positive ways possible. You have the rare ability to engage at both the personal level and communal level, envisioning policy change that will solve systemic and individual problems alike. You are a quiet leader. You have, since you have arrived here, you've been a bridge builder. You have helped and worked hard to improve Harvard Law School. For these reasons, I'm honored to present you this year's Rickheimer Prize. These next awards, thank you, for community leadership. Students receiving these awards have enriched our community in a myriad of ways. Through academic excellence, public service, and creative vision, nominations for the Dean's Awards were submitted by faculty, staff, and students. I ask the awardees to stand and remain standing until I've read all the names. I kindly ask the audience to refrain a little bit so that we can listen to each name and after I've said them all, you can give them a big, huge applause. The recipients for this year's 2016 Dean's Awards for Community Leadership are Mavra Aga, Nadia Christine Arud, Avani Bonso. Sean Cuddyhigh, Elizabeth Curran, Ariel Uckblad, Jonathan R. Gardner, Jacob B. Hanna, Amanda Brooke Levine, Faye Akua Mason, Megan R. Marks, Janae X. Moxe, Carlos Andres Pagan, Petra Pasalova, Catherine Taylor Poor, Michael Elias Seamus, Leland S. Shelton, Ariel A. Sims, Kyle John Strickland, and Tyler Vegan. Thank you all. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Next, we acknowledge the public interest auction co-chairs. The co-chairs were responsible for planning, executing, and coordinating the public interest auction in their first year at law school. The purpose of the public interest auction is to raise money for summer public interest funding for students who choose to pursue public interest work during the summers. Countless hours of work go into planning this event, from fundraising, volunteer recruitment and coordination, marketing and planning of the silent and live auctions. These students worked tirelessly throughout their first year and volunteered hundreds of hours, as one else, to bring the HLS community together for a wonderful cause. And for that, it is a highlight of each academic year. Please stand and be recognized for your heroic effort. Isabel Gillian Brewer, Karen Dildai, Julie Hamilton, Chen Jiang, Beatrice Lamango Paterno, and Jillian Allison Wagman. Thank you.
but I'm happy to turn now to turn the mic over to Yassine Odi. Hi, everyone. And I, in turn, will turn the mic over to Diana Libanow. Let's look forward and let's look back. We have all written so many exams and papers, volunteered for journals, student organizations, community work, research projects, clinics. That's the Harvard mindset, always dreaming big and always being on the move for what's next. But with our constant focus on the future, the question is, what remains from our time here at Harvard? And the answer is quite simple, the friendships we forged. I thoroughly under enjoyed the diversity of the Harvard Law School community, but I also came to appreciate its adversity. Many events stirred up the community in our final year, but the constant confrontation with racial justice, identity, and freedom of speech forced me to reflect on my values as a foreign lawyer and at the same time enabled me to understand American society better. I am very grateful to be part of this community and to have made so many friends because of it. I share this connection with the esteemed gentleman who is about to step to the podium next. I have the honor of introducing the person who, on an institutional level, helps us maintain and expand our Harvard community. Salvo Arena, the president of the Harvard Law School Association, which connects more than 38,000 alumni in 148 countries around the world. Salvo entered the Harvard LLM program after he obtained his law degree and PhD from the University of Catania, Italy. He, is cur he currently serves as the managing partner of the New York office of one of Italy's leading law firms, Geomanti. His focus is on mergers and acquisitions as well as private equity, advising both international and domestic clients. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Salvo Arena. Thank you very much, Diana. So from uh, Germany to Italy, it's our favorite final of a soccer cup all the time. So uh, my name is Salvo Arena, and I'm LLM class of 2000. I have the honor and the privilege to be the president of the Harvard Law School Association. On behalf of the HLSA, congratulations, congratulations to the seven 680 members of the class 2016 who will be receiving JD, LLMs, and SJD degrees. So the Harvard Law School Association was founded in 1886 by 400 alumni. Today, the HLSA has more than 38,000 members with a mission to foster networking and mutual support amongst Harvard Law School alumni, faculty, and students. The Harvard Law School Association is the umbrella organization which operates through 32 vibrant and active clubs in U.S. and around the world, and 11 shared interest groups, including the Black Alumni Network, the Women's Alliance Network, and the Recent Graduates Network, where I hope to see all of you be actively engaged and involved. Recently, we launched three new important SIGs, the Entrepreneurs Network, the in-house counsel network, and the private equity venture capital network. In 2015, through the clubs and the six, the HLSA organized more than 100 events, including some joint events with the Harvard Business School Alumni Association, with the attendance of over, over 5,000 alumni. What makes the HLSA unique? That's what I really like to repeat you know, from time to time. It's a deep sense of belonging to a community of the most remarkable people, a community which goes beyond any geographical border, political affiliation, social class, religion, and race, a community that Harvard Law School creates every year. Nowadays, more than ever, people feel the necessity to be part of a platform 
while we have the privilege and the honor to be part of the most powerful and beneficial platform in the world. Your network is not just your class, but is the global network of all Harvard Law School alumni, past, present, and future. In the last three years, you have received the best legal education you could have. In the next 50, 60, 70 years, you will be part of the HLS alumni community and have a such a unique opportunity to stay connected with incredibly thoughtful and insightful people from different stages of their lives who have the benefit to share a profound education from the best school in the world. I invite you to be actively involved with your local club at NSIG to wear the HLS pin and to stay connected by joining us on the Harvard Law School alumni LinkedIn, the HLSA Facebook page, and the Instagram account, and to use the alumni magnet, a new web platform that allows alumni to be updated and connected easier and faster. Now let me close with just a few personal remarks. Uh, I come from uh, a humble family in Italy, and I grew up with the dream to study at Harvard Law School and be part of an elite group of professionals who could change the world. To most of my friends, it seemed to be an unrealistic dream, impossible to pursue, because I didn't have financial resources, personal mentoring, and no one in my city had ever gained an LLM at American University at that time. And they were right. Uh, when I was admitted to the LLM program in 1998, I did not have enough money to come over, but I did not give up. I asked the admission office to be postponed to the following year in order to have more time to find financial help. It was not easy, but I did not quit. I did not settle. I did not listen to the people who suggested me to follow a more conventional path. So I pursued my dream. But remember, as you know, dreams without goals are just dreams and often can be disappointing. In order to achieve your goals, you need to work systematically towards them to have discipline, motivation, determination, consistency every day. In the last 16 years, through the HLSA network, I've met extraordinary people who have changed my life. The Harvard Law School has given you the tools to make a difference. They are, and now it's really up to you. Take your chance. Utilize your education and the power of the HLSA network to change the world for the better. And don't be afraid of failing. Infallibility is not a virtue. Work hard, think big, and dream impossible dreams. And remember, never give up. Your success is limited only by the extent of your imagination and your commitment to hard work and persistence. You are the future. You can change the future for the better. The world we live in can be tough, it can be unjust, but in the last three years, you have been trained to do something about it. From tomorrow, you will be in the arena to build the world you want to live in. Let your passion and your heart drive you through. Good luck, and once again, congratulations to all of you and to your families on your extraordinary achievement in graduating from this incredible law school. Thank you. Hello. I have the honor of presenting the Suzanne L. Richardson Staff Appreciation Award to Gabriela Gonzalez Follett. The award recognizes a single staff member for her commitment to the student experience and her concern for the life and work of HLS students. Ms. Follett serves as a program assistant for the Human Rights Program. Several students who participated in the International Human Rights Clinic have told me that she is a tireless advocate and friend. Ms. Follett also has been a staff supporter of the Reclaim HLS movement. Last December, she wrote a moving opinions piece in the Harvard Law Record in which she said, it's my job as a staff member to serve the HLS community. But just because I serve does not make me a servant. 
Many people at HLS understand this, but an institution that has a strong caste system with very few people of color at the top, it is inevitable that some individuals treat staff as the other. A local Latina, Ms. Follett, grew up in Dorchester. In 2013, she graduated from the University of Vermont, where she served as a diversity recruitment admissions counselor. She later planned and implemented recruitment activities in Brooklyn, Bronx, and Queens, and she coordinated various student diversity programs, including a bridge project that focused on providing support for students of color at under-resourced high schools in the Bronx. Ms. Follett has a passion for supporting and mentoring low-income students of color and wishes to increase the recruitment and retention of students of color in higher education. She is currently pursuing a master's degree at the Ed School to achieve her professional goals. Ms. Follett also is a talented singer, serving as a member of the University of Vermont's a cappella group, The Hit Paws. One HLS student told me that Ms. Follett sang at Reclaim HLS's Belinda Hall commencement earlier this month, and that, her, and that her impactful voice gave the attendees strength and courage during the event. With that, I am pleased to introduce the winner of the Suzanne L. Richardson Staff Appreciation Award, Gabriela Gonzalez Follett. So Professor Montoya um, was here earlier this year. She was a Harvard Law School graduate, and she came to talk to um, a bunch of students, and she talked about the importance of bending traditionally white spaces. Um, so that's, that's what this is. Uh, so it's actually a uh, cloth from Colombia, and um, my family from Colombia actually cannot be here today, so this is also in their spirit. Imagine, imagine a small notebook about the size of your hand. Now imagine yourself clenching the book, the edges frayed from your sweaty palms. You sit in a crowded train, close your eyes, and try to memorize the words scribbled in that small notebook you clench. They are your code, the third language you are learning, erudite, pedagogy, macrocosm, amend. If you memorize these words, no one will find out you are an other. If you study how other people say them, these words will protect you from being perceived as irrelevant, not worthy, like you don't belong. Cariña, sweetheart, you tell yourself. Calmante, breathe. And you take comfort in the sweet melody of Erica Badu ringing in your ears. This was my routine every morning when I first took a job as a program assistant at Harvard Law School. That small book, you all imagined in your hand was my survival kit at the time, my guide to Harvard Law School. I grew up just across the river from this law school in Dorchester, but it was a world away. As a girl, it was a wonderful world with street double judge, Sunday church gatherings, and scavenging for change with my twin to buy blue slushies. But over time, I learned to avoid questions that would unveil my upbringing. People tend to shift uncomfortably when you tell them you grew up in Dorchester, a neighborhood some only knew for the media's coverage of its crime. When I tell people what my mom did for a living, there was, all, there was often an awkward silence that would loom until they'd switch to a topic like the weather. You know when you're in a clothing store and you've finished trying things on and then you hand the clothes you don't want to the employee working there? That employee was my mom at the Macy's bra section in Downtown Crossing. I was proud that my mother had a job. She had, she had found the courage and motivation to apply for work that wasn't so exhausting. That she no longer had to get down on her knees on the night shift to scrub the floor at Boston Medical Center. As her daughter, I saw her power, wisdom, and magic every day. But when I would mention my mother's job to others outside of Dorchester, they responded as if I admitted something embarrassing. 
Over time, I became timid and silent. I've, it felt as though the way the world saw my mother was perhaps how Harvard Law School saw me, unintelligent by its standard, someone who did not know the right words. And so when I was hired at the human rights program at Harvard Law School, I bought a small black book and began to fill it with words. And then I got caught. A student in this audience today, Aaron Bray, someone from my hood, heard me using some of those words and asked me, why are you talking like that? And it got me thinking, why do I feel so ashamed of where I came from? Why do I give these words the power to define my voice? I knew my voice was strong and true. I'd use it in the college admissions process to advocate for students of color from the Bronx. I'd use it to campaign for gender justice at the Women's Center at the University of Vermont. And I'd use it to speak out here in Boston against the Olympic Games coming to Dorchester and further gentrifying my neighborhood. But at Harvard Law School, that voice was gone, and I didn't know how to get it back. Until one day, when the HLS community had a gathering to talk about systemic racism, and another graduating student today, Kiin Kiris Alan Gassessa, stood up to talk. All semester, she'd seen beyond the recommendation letters I was filing and events I was organizing to ask my opinion on current events and racial justice. She encouraged me to post on Socratic shortcomings a blog created by students of color to share stories about identity and diversity at HLS. She showed me that my voice mattered. Now, there she was, standing in front of several hundred of her peers and teachers, advocating for staff to be included in discussions and decision-making about how to improve HLS for people of color. At that moment, I set aside all my fear about showing my true self and, stu and stood up to speak without using any of the words in my book. I haven't looked back since. So I want to take time out to thank those two students right now for inspiring to use my own voice and my own words for what I feel is right. In Reclaim Harvard Law, the school-wide movement committed to racial justice, I found my people. In that space, I didn't have to take out my little black book. I brought my true voice. So did everyone else. It was an organic, improvised kind of learning. We read articles, watched plays, heard poetry, and discussed how to apply radical theories to our daily lives. It was beautiful. It started with struggle, and the struggle continues. But at the heart of it all, it is about love and community for people on campus now and in years to come. The magical Maya Angelou once said, people forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Thank you, class of 2016, and most specifically, Reclaim Harvard Law, for making me feel like I mattered, beyond my job description. Thank you for challenging me to let go of the assumption I made about you all, that you were all privileged people who would define my worth by how many words I knew and pronounced correctly in my little black book. Those assumptions had been placed for years, and you managed to dismantle them in the space of a semester. If you can do that in a semester, Think of what you can do by listening to and valuing the voices of others around you, the people who don't know the words in the book, the people who have different kinds of knowledge, knowledge that comes from immigrating from Bogota to Boston, working the night shift to support her four children, and raising those children to stand up on stage at Harvard Law School and speak in their own true voice. My, mo my mother and I never thought that knowledge would be valued. Thank you, class of 2016, for saying with this award that it is. My name is Amy Wolfson, I'm an LLM from the United Kingdom, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce this year's recipient of the Albert M. Sachs Paul A. Freund Award for Teaching Excellence. This award is given each year to a single faculty member in recognition of their teaching ability, attentiveness to student concerns, and general contributions to student life at the law school. This year's recipient is quite special. 
Professor Jeannie Sook graduated from Harvard Law School in 2002. She served as a law clerk to David H. Souter on the United States Supreme Court. She worked as an assistant district attorney in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office before joining the faculty here. This year marks a decade of her teaching. In 2009, Professor Sook was awarded the Guggenheim Fellowship. Her second book, At Home in the Law, How the Domestic Violence Revolution is Transforming Privacy, was awarded the Law and Society Association's Herbert Jacob Prize for the Best Law and Society Book of the Year. She was invited to testify before Congress on law and innovation in fashion, and she became the first 10 years Asian American woman on the faculty at Harvard Law School. As a teacher, Professor Sook has touched the lives of so many students through her expansive community involvement, her remarkable teaching, and her glamorous tenure photo. <laughs> and while her cold calling can at times induce fear, it is her exceptional use of this pedagogy that sets her apart. A member of the class of 2016 wrote that she masterfully exercises the Socratic method intertwining legal doctrine with contextual learning in order to transform students' understanding of how law shapes society. She also encourages students to think critically about their ideas and intuitions so that they can be better equipped as lawyers and professionals. Professor Sook serves our law school with extraordinary integrity as a section leader, teacher, mentor and advocate. Please join me in congratulating Professor Jeannie Sook, the 2016 recipient of the Albert M. Sachs Paul A. Freund Award for Teaching Excellence. <laughs> Members of the Harvard Law School Class of 2016, thank you so much for this honor. I am so grateful to celebrate your graduation with you in this very special way. On class day back in 2002, I sat where you sit now, and I had the joy of seeing my esteemed mentor, Lonnie Guinier, receive this teaching award. I couldn't have envisioned myself standing here addressing you, but now we are bonded forever. This summer marks the 10-year anniversary of my appointment to this faculty. I've always considered the Sachs Freund Award the highest honor imaginable because working with students is what has made me most eager to get up in the morning. I am able to do what I do because you have been so excited to be challenged and so fun to engage. You have been so game to interrogate assumptions, including your own. You have been playful, serious, experimental, and critical with the traditions of legal education that were developed here. And I must say to the parents and grandparents, thank you for giving us the best graduating class I have ever seen. My own dad drove up from New York today to attend. He hasn't seen me teach, but I know what he has to be thinking. Both he and my mother as young children fled North Korea as refugees during the Korean War in 1950. I was born in a repressive military dictatorship in South Korea. Our family came as immigrants to this country in 1979 when I was six years old. I didn't speak English, and I was extremely shy and so inhibited that I went through much of my own schooling, even in my 20s, never saying a word out loud. How could I now be a teacher who communicates with so many students? What made me grow from a silent young person to one whose primary job it is to speak to others about law and about democracy, no less. One reason my father's family had to flee their home in North Korea was that his father was an open critic of the totalitarian government 
that had taken power, and it was not safe for the family to stay. With this in my family's history, I have wondered how people get the courage, not just to speak, but when necessary, to say things that may win them disfavor or rebuke, to express truths that resist the tide, to say no when people expect yes or nothing at all. To me, that is what teaching is for. Teaching and learning are not only about grasping a subject like criminal law or torts or contracts. They're about experiencing ways to engage together in genuine conversation and critique on the most difficult problems we face as a society. Being challenged to think the unthinkable and say the unsayable. Harvard Law School taught that to me. What I have loved most as a teacher is witnessing students' journey from fear and quiet to find voices to engage in vital conversations, to question each other and themselves, to question authority, and not to accept the status quo. The health of our democracies depend on our willingness to do that with each other and not let fear be the driver of what we don't say. Teaching is something we all do in our lives, not just in the classroom. You have taught me, you have taught each other, and you will teach a world that you will influence and change. More than any class in recent memory, the class of 2016 has taught us at this school to question the status quo and to ask why things should not be different, more just, more inclusive, and equal. Teaching that really helps make lasting change is vitally about listening to, especially listening generously to voices that disagree and considering possibilities that make you uncomfortable and unsettled enough that you have to think even harder about what may be right. When you are really listening intently with openness, it is hard to dehumanize the other. This has been an important and telling year. The perspectives on a world that dominates our public debates seem so intractably divided on matters large and small. The state of discourse on important issues has had many of us in despair, wanting to throw up our hands and stay home. But it's crucial that we not stay away. You graduates have a lot of work in front of you a lot of active listening and speaking, a lot of teaching, a lot of difficult conversations with people who disagree with you about what to do on problems of utmost importance and urgency for our future. With your teachers, I take to heart the role of this school in the future of this country and the world. And of course, that impact depends primarily on you, our graduates. Soon enough, you are going to have a lot of power. You will have responsibility for decisions that have real consequences for other people, people who may be quite different from you. When you wield that power, the trust that is placed in you won't actually be about whether you remember the specific rules and doctrines that you were examined on in your courses. That is fine, because according to me, that is not what this education is for. If you are graduating from here with more humility and integrity, with more willingness to consider perspectives and arguments other than your own, and with more attentiveness to the humanity of others, then you have received an education worthy of this school's aspirations. And I hope that you will try every day to attain that for yourself and teach it to others. I am so excited to see what you will do to change our world for the better. And truly, I will believe in you for as long as I have breath. Congratulations, class of 2016. Okay, the moment I've been waiting for. <laughs> My name 
is Yasin Eldik. Woo! You all already knew that. And I have the pleasure of introducing this year's Class Day speaker. In 1993, the French fashion designer, Christian Louboutin, took red nail polish and painted the soles of a pair of stiletto shoes to make them, in his words, pop. More than two decades later, almost a million pairs of his wildly famous red-soled Louboutin shoes sell every year. And as every smart law student knows, this level of success cannot be reached without at least one courtroom drama. In 2011, Christian Louboutin sued Yves Saint, sued Yves Saint Laurent for producing shoes that used a red sole. As evidence of trademark infringement, lawyers for Louboutin invoked Sarah Jessica Parker. The lawyers wrote, in episodes of Sex and the City, as well as in both Sex and the City movies, the lead characters regularly wore Louboutin footwear, referencing multiple photos of Ms. Parker as Carrie Bradshaw wearing Louboutin's red-soled shoes. These attorneys explained that the character of Carrie Bradshaw is, of course, played by famous actress and high fashion leader, Sarah Jessica Parker. As a cultural icon and global superstar, lawyers cite to her. <laughs> the case got complicated, but let's just say Louboutin's trademark is still intact. The Harvard Law Library's Fashion and the Law exhibit features Ms. Parker's inclusion in this case. As the Louboutin lawyers understood, and as we all do, Sarah Jessica Parker is an institution. She has been working in film and television for almost 40 years. Ms. Parker, or Sarah Jessica, has gone on to win two Emmy Awards four Golden Globes, and three Screen Actors Guild Awards. And yet, as much as Ms. Parker has entertained us, making us laugh, breaking our hearts, and reminding us of the importance of friendship, she has harnessed her influence to make the world safer and better for those to whom society has been less kind. Ms. Parker has served as a UNICEF ambassador since 1997. She has raised funds for an initiative aimed at simplifying the detection and treatment of HIV AIDS in developing countries. As the first national spokeswoman for the UNICEF TAP project, she has helped bring clean water to developing countries. Having made her Broadway debut at the tender age of 11, Ms. Parker is a strong and consistent advocate for the arts. In 2009, President Obama appointed Sarah Jessica to the President's Committee on the Arts and the Humanities, advising the White House on arts and humanities education, policy issues surrounding cultural exchange, and other topics. Ms. Parker has worked with public schools in Oregon and Minnesota as part of the Turnaround Arts Program, helping low-performing schools increase student achievement through arts education. Some of Sarah Jessica's most recent work has focused on women military service members and veterans. She works with First Lady and Harvard Law School alum, Michelle Obama, on their Joining Forces initiative, which collaborates with employers to ensure that women service members, veterans, and their families have the tools they need to succeed 
throughout their lives. Sarah Jessica also serves as vice chair of the New York City Ballet Board of Directors. And through it all, Sarah Jessica has remained a fashion icon. She has graced the cover of Vogue magazine a whopping six times, a record I plan to break. <laughs> she is also an entrepreneur, having started her own fragrance and footwear lines. Sarah Jessica remarkably uses her influence and reputation to call attention to important social issues. Hopefully, once we leave Harvard Law School, we can do the same. Please join me in welcoming actress, producer, humanitarian, advocate, fashion maven, Yasin Eldik's friend, <laughs> and all around superwoman, Sarah Jessica Parker. Oh, thank you, Yasin. I feel I've known you my entire life. I suspect I will. <laughs> On January 13th of this year, I received a most surprising and unexpected missive from Marcia Sells, your Dean of Students, requesting that I might consider speaking to you all on this special and important day in your lives. I was flattered, delighted, honored, so I immediately said no. I don't think of myself as a conventional speaker for this type of occasion, but after much heated deliberation between terrified, cowardly me and brave, adventurous me, the better argument won. I said yes. And I've also known Marcia since I was eight years old, both of us little girls growing up in Cincinnati, Ohio. And now, as then, I still just want Marcia to like me. <laughs> in the days since accepting your gracious invitation, you have all been on my mind a lot, dominated somewhat by a concern that you really meant to invite Mary Louise Parker, or Camilla Parker Bowles, or Sarah Michelle Geller, or Neil Patrick Harris. But of course, my real and great concern was, what would I, could I say, to be deserving, nay, worthy of such an occasion, because you are the 2016 Harvard Law School graduates. A sort, of, a sort of highly impressive noun, a very fine noun, certainly distinguished, except in my experience, um, generally speaking, if you suddenly find yourself in a room facing a large number of lawyers, that's really not a good sign. That's like not a harbinger of good times ahead. Unless, of course, you're playing one on television. Um, Joanne Harris, assistant district attorney. Equal justice, anyone? No, it's cool, it's cool. You weren't born yet. But gradually, I began to think of you less as a group and more as individuals. The collective part began to break away and reveal, at least in my imagination, each singular person, and there was this comforting, welcome shift when May 25th became not about me, but deservedly, appropriately, about you, about all of you. So at last we meet, and I finally now get to see all of you extraordinary men and women. And having thought of you for so long, having struggled to find the right words to inspire you, having been, frankly, haunted by you, I just want to say, 
get out of my head. <laughs> Sincerely, what I have been most looking forward to saying to you is how enormously proud I am of your accomplishments. And if I am filled with this gushing pride, I can only imagine how your chests swell today, having arrived at this destination. I wish I could shout out your names one by one, but I know that's reserved for tomorrow. However, it seems a bit of a shame that after sitting seriously and attentively semester after semester to reach this amazing goal, you have to once again listen to someone else talk instead of letting your feelings out. So wouldn't it be grand, isn't it right and good and entirely appropriate after all you have done to shout out to me and the world your own names? So it's a sort of unconventional exercise, but if you are game, on the count of three, I want you to shout your name and let it speak for your joy. Be your least modest self. Let the sound of your names be filled with all the feelings that describe these last three, the last years of your singular efforts. Do I have a majority? Do people want to shout their names out? All right, on the count of three. One, two, three. Oh, so well done, so well done. Not surprising that you did that so beautifully. I'm Sarah Jessica, and it's very nice to meet you. And good afternoon to Dean Minow, the Harvard class marshals, parents, students, faculty, and distinguished guests, President Arena, Professor Jeannie Sook, Gabriella Follett, and of course my friend, Dean of Students, Marsha Sells. I thank you all for including me today. Graduates, it is truly a profound honor to celebrate your achievement and a privilege to be asked to share some thoughts. As I mentioned, even though we've just met, you have become, over these last months, co-inhabitants, cohabitants of my life, a great part of my waking thoughts, the interrupter of other thoughts, thoughts I should be having, the cause of many sleepless nights, a distraction, and a beautiful burden. In other words, you've basically become my children, <laughs> which means that I'd really just love it if you would text me back, uh, if you would maybe let me know if you're coming home tonight or not. And um, maybe this is a, a good, bright time, you see, in good spirits to let you know that we've turned your bedroom into a um, den slash home office. As parents, our goal is to raise kind, happy, independent people. We want to send our children out into the world to share themselves, to connect, to contribute, to lead rich, complicated, challenging, and joyful lives. They must leave to do this. But thinking of this next chapter of your lives, I want to stand in front of every train that's about to hit you. I want to be there to assure you that you will recover from heartbreak, to convince you on your most blue day that you will not always feel so alone, to remind you not to sacri sacrifice your integrity, even when it might feel a much more swift avenue toward your goal. To whisper in your ear that other people's opinion of you doesn't have to be the opinion you keep of yourself. To encourage you to think twice before saying nothing. To promise the job is coming, the romance around the corner, the full rich life you long for is just up ahead, and that you can indeed have life and literature. However, that would do you no good at all. And we parents and teachers don't really want that. And though at moments that might be tempting for all parties, you don't want that either. And like my own offspring, I have my hopes and ambitions for you. So the thoughts I offer you today are the same I offer to my children, or rather I would offer it if I didn't know it would only elicit a sort of tortured rolling of the eyes. 
like a certain 13-year-old in my house. Because when you're young or just beginning, advice is sort of like experience's boring cousin that no one really wanted to invite and arrives at the party about an hour early and just hangs around the kitchen criticizing the food. But if you'll indulge me, I do have a few thoughts. Things I've learned as an actor, a parent, a business person, a citizen, and as someone who has had the extraordinary good fortune to pursue the things that I love. So I have a list of hopes that I have collected and that I would like to be able to confer upon you. May I approach? <laughs> Number one, I hope that you can maintain your individuality that you will find a way to continue to be the individual you discovered over these past years as you march toward this day. Please remember, even as you get swept by the current of desire, ambition, and great satisfaction, it was you alone who sorted all this out. You all did it your own way. You established systems of progress, preparation, Despite the help you may have received along the way, it was, in the end, an individual undertaking. I can share with you that there have been many attempts from the outside world to change me. My approach, my appearance, my choices. For the most part, I have resisted, much to the chagrin, often, of those who believe they had my best interest at heart. They simply wanted to make it easier for me lessen the resistance I might find if I was willing to alter myself. I am not going to suggest that I was evolved enough to see the error in doing so. But there was a little voice that said, don't. Be gracious, listen, appreciate the care and advice, but there are times, Sarah Jessica, to keep your own counsel. As we say in acting, take the note, but do it your way. And I continue to believe in taking the good note from anyone, but be an original. So have a deep belief in who you are, what you want to say, what you look like, and cling to your sense of self and uniqueness. It is a great thing to know how to belong to oneself. We need more than ever. We are counting on you to, be, to bring your big, gorgeous, different, unconventional, crazy, just nuts, surprising, kind, innovative, unfamiliar ideas and selves. That's the energy that will spark the ideas and the collaborations that will change the world. As the beloved author A. A. Milne said about himself, the things that make me different are the things that make me. Number two. I hope that you honor and nurture your curiosity. Curiosity is way more powerful than comfort. Comfort is very seductive. It envelops you. It seems to ask nothing in return. It's necessary on occasion, but it can be a beautiful prison. Curiosity, I'm convinced, is the gateway to everything you know you want. I have found in my own life, both professionally and personally, that every time I throw myself into an exploration of the unknown, that I let curiosity lead, I receive new, bless you, and stimulating ideas and relationships that alter the course of my life. I have a peculiar addiction for any world that's not my own. I want to know as best I can the person most unlike myself. I want to travel to the far-flung region. I want to better understand the other side to see, I want to, smell, I, I want to smell it and see it and know the foreign, to experience the foreign, to be uncomfortable, to be the outsider. The most vibrant, engaging, and wonderfully exhausting experiences have come from my endless curiosity. I am a better mother, wife, friend, and colleague for it. But that means that I'm often in a smackdown with the new, the brand new, and I'm actually not at all a brave person. Despite what might seem a lack of self-awareness, I will tell you that my true nature is timidity. 
But I also know that my most valuable asset is my insatiable curiosity, and every time I call upon it, I am awakened. Number three, I hope you can know that to want is a gift. We are all different. We come from radically different backgrounds from all parts of the world. We have our own singular narratives and trajectories. But despite all those differences, I think we can all recall something that we really, really wanted, pined for, worked toward, put on a list, and finally, at last, earned or received. And the glory when it was ours. I never want to forget that feeling. I came from a family that struggled financially. I am one of eight kids. For the most part, as children, we had what we needed, but rarely the things we wanted. For many years now, I have recognized that this was and remains a great gift because it created in me a hunger, a focused ambition, a work ethic that is a sort of point of operation and pride for me. Despite the successes you are sure to achieve, material or otherwise, never stop wanting. In wanting is energy, surprise, youth, motion. In not wanting is inertia. Number four, I hope you will be dreamers. Not just dreamers, but big, really big dreamers. Dreamers of the what-ifs that seem on the surface impossible, but which hold the promise of great joy and wonderment and justice. I wholeheartedly disagree with the definition of dreamer as one who lives in fantasy, is impractical, or unrealistic. I much prefer the definition of dreamer as one who is considered audacious or visionary. Okay, first of all, dreaming is one of the most relaxing, restorative, wonderfully private occupiers of time. Secondly, dreaming holds the capacity to beautifully suspend time because there are no limits. That said, however, avoid the dangers of what in the theater we call being too result-oriented, a limiting and deceptive principle. It becomes a most unwelcome sort of very vigilant spam filter. I describe it this way. Creating the ending first, it forces you onto a one-way road, a sort of creative cul-de-sac, with no route for exploration or the unexpected. You can't produce a truly original thought or innovative thinking if you are backing into an idea with blinders on. So keep your field of vision wide open so that dreams may lead to other dreams. But here's the rub. It is not going to be a straight line. There are detours that necessity will dictate along the way. I have had many in my own life. You can probably name them. The bad television shows, the bad movies that I did to pay rent or to simply eat. But I refuse to let the those um, less than inspiring deviations erode my greater goals. At times, I felt very disheartened and a sense of deep disillusionment. But I was vigilant about hanging on to my dream. So I implore you not to give up. Even in the face of unthinkable discouragement, keep your greatest desires in safe shelter and marry your dreams to action. Number five, I hope that you learn to wrangle your fears. Don't try to vanquish them. Personally, I seem to encounter fear a lot. I'm like a heat-seeking missile. I'm on a, like a constant blind date with fear. And it often brings along its good friend anxiety. Um, I used to never talk about this. I was convinced that to admit to the fear out loud would only strengthen and embolden it. So I became a sort of expert at the shove, at the dismissal, but I found that it had legs and stamina. In fact, the more I tried to contain it, the more powerful it became, as if it was nourishing itself on my very resistance. So one day, I chose to address it formally. Hello, fear. And the modest act of acknowledging it was like 
putting a tiny needle in an overinflated balloon. The simple act of speaking its name gave me charge. So I encourage you to capture your fear, harness it, direct it, talk about it. You will find solidarity in others. Because, come on, show of hands, who's, who, who's sort of kind of terrified 24 hours a day? All right, I'm in the minority. Number six, I hope you recognize that strength can come from disappointment. Living disappointment is like, it's like being kicked sideways. It's brutal. It's a, it's, it's a kick in the rubber parts. It's a low-grade, chronic stomach ache. Disappointment feels lonely and awful and unfair, but an outcome that can make you feel that lousy was surely worth your efforts. So feel it. Lounge in it. Suffer. Stay in bed. Indulge. Invite your friends over, eat too much, weep, moan, push on the bruise for two days. And then rally. And you will look back with fondness and even romance at those occasions. You will laugh, and most importantly, you will, you will be proud of what you did next. How it prepared you for the next disappointment. And you will learn that no matter how gutted, there is recovery. You will see the coping mechanisms you develop, the empathy you cultivate, how it makes you a better friend, partner, employee, employer, and person. Number seven, I hope you treasure the accumulation of the triumphs the world doesn't see. I spent years auditioning for roles, pounding the pavement. I got some jobs, I didn't get others. I was a journeyman, and I loved it. Every now and then I'm asked by young actors for advice, and I give the same advice to my son, whom, to our great delight, we have discovered is a serious student. I tell them, prepare. Prepare, but don't plan. Do everything within your means to be as informed as is possible. It's the process that's most important. I say, give the best audition you can. Walk in with confidence that you have something unique to offer. And afterwards, lay in bed at night knowing you did all you could within your resources to be ready. The goal is to feel good when you walk out of the door of that audition. It's the little triumphs that the world can't see that add up, that really stick, that give you sustenance. It's the ever, every effort that makes you better regardless of immediate reward. It has been my quiet private triumphs, even when I didn't get the part, which have guided me to my own personal success. Number eight, I hope you will always know that listening is your secret weapon. It is a demanding technique and can be particularly challenging for smart people who have so much to share. It requires an exhausting rigor and discipline, especially when faced with those whose opinions and ideology is anathema. By listening with a clear head and open heart, we can plant seeds of empathy and show others the most formidable artillery is knowledge and respect. Number nine, I hope you can distinguish the bad rules from the good ones. There used to be a blueprint, a sort of a set of recognized and reliable pathways, rules, that determined our careers, our expectations, and sometimes our future. But, and I don't have to tell you, the world has changed. We live in a time of unpredictability, instability, where change is common currency, and many of the old rules don't apply. Speaking as a bit of a rule breaker myself, I'm grateful for the absence of some of these more traditional rules of life. Rules that were used to define us from the outside, that characterized us by gender or class or race or orientation, and were used to limit our value, ambitions, and contributions. I would call these bad rules. But there is a rule for which I am particularly grateful and which deep in my heart I believe to be timeless and indisputable, the golden rule. Maybe that seems corny or naive, 
I don't even mind. I would much rather risk the accusation of being naive than shield myself in the comfortable confidence of cynicism. So as you redraw a path for your generation, I urge that you rely upon decency, principle, and nobility. They aren't qualities that we herald lately. We seem to have a great deal more interest in the stories of success. There is much ink spilled these days, well, not as much ink, a lot of blogging, that grab our limited attention by celebrating matters of money and fame, success, status. But success can and should mean being a trusted friend, partner, and collaborator, being a person with a steady sense of goodness and a reliable compass pointing toward the humane and empathetic. I say without hesitation or embarrassment, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I fall short of this de destination at times, but it is still the hook on which I hang my hat. It remains my beacon, the only rule I can always count on. And ultimately, I believe it's what gives us the most meaningful success, the admiration and trust of those whose lives we touch. At the end of the day, all we have is our honor. So there you have it, my nine hopes. I bet your hope is that I'm wrapping this up soon. But it occurs to me that there is a certain theme here to these hopes, and it connects both my world in the arts and yours in law. And that is, at its heart, in its very essence, bless you, and purpose, our work is about people, human beings, the beauty of a dramatic moment or perfectly reasoned argument is irrelevant if it lives in a world separate from the people it affects. And there is a certain larger context in which these hopes exist that we can't and shouldn't ignore. I know that these past few years, as students, as citizens, you have been involved in an unusual amount of challenges, change, and the struggle for change. In many ways, the power and recognition of and the resistance to change has defined our decade and century. Change, of course, is not always pleasant. It is certainly not always easy. But whether we like it or not, change is and always will be the natural state of the world, which is why the possibility of change, of transformation, Transformation is the central dilemma of the great philosophies, of great religions, of art, and of course of law. Change is what we simultaneously hope for and fear. It is both the corridor to all that is better and the last corner we turn. Not all change, of course, is to be celebrated. When we get sick and our bodies seem to turn against us, that's change we fight against. We employ every resource to counteract it and to regain our strength, to return to something, something like our former happy self, as we recall it, our happy state. I think we all recognize that there is a sort of illness at loose in the world today, not an illness of decay or disrepair, it is far more insidious than that. It is an illness born of fear, and it is metastasizing in our political body, breaking down our sense of compassion, of understanding, of acceptance, our ability to see each other as human. So I urge you to take what you can of these hopes to attach them to the skills you have acquired and use them to help us. Help guide us through these fears toward and through change. To do whatever you can to shape the world as a place that does lean toward justice and compassion. It's a big dream. Nine hopes wrapped in one mighty dream. 
But if you capture the intelligence and the energy you have and allow it to benefit others, if you grant yourself the joy of discovering that when you give greedily, the returns can be monumental, well then, I have every confidence in you. The world anticipates and is in vital need of your next move. Be bold, be generous, throw yourself toward the unfamiliar. Let curiosity be your guide. After all, look at what you just did. You came here, individuals from all over the world. You worked alone or you found groups. You ate when you needed to, you slept when you could. You overcame every possible obstacle thrown in your path, whether by yourself or academic demands. You fought exhaustion, insecurities, and time. You found a community, you found a home, and most importantly, you found yourself. The world of law awaits your good sense, your unique perspective, and your careful consideration. Art, culture, politics, community, and the larger world beckon for your head and your heart. I know you are ready. The people rest. We want to close with one more thank you to our families and friends, the professors and staff, and of course to Sarah Jessica Parker for joining us here for class day. Please help us continue the celebration now with a reception on Jarvis Field and the Crossroads patio. We are looking forward to seeing everyone tomorrow for commencement. Once again, congratulations to the class of 2016.